next speaker is uh, Benjamin Faulkner from Geology. Thank you. I'm not sure why my parents sat me down in front of Jurassic Park at age two, but it really did a number on me. I spent the majority of my time from preschool to about sixth grade, crouched over like this, waiting to pounce on a herd of unsuspecting plant eaters. And speaking of plant eaters, the narrators of dinosaur documentaries would often say, in this ancient community thrived many types of herbivores, hunted by a few carnivores. Which makes sense, because plants have been around for over 400 million years. They're found just about everywhere, and they can't run away. If we look at reptiles today, however, there's a profound and surprising lack of plant eaters. Fewer than 3% of lizards and no snake species get the majority of their food from green plant material. This is strange, especially considering the storied history of reptile plant eaters from long ago. This includes dinosaurs, of course, but there were also great grazing tortoises and even leaf-munching crocodiles. So, what changed? To explain why modern reptiles tend to skip their vegetables, it helps you identify who could eat plants in the past and the features in their bones that give that away. The good news is, animal bodies are fundamentally shaped by the foods they are adapted to eat. I'm currently testing the idea that plant-eating reptiles will have wider or deeper hips than their meat-eating cousins, allowing the space they need to hold the big guts necessary to burn through tough leaves. By establishing my methods with living reptiles like iguanas, I have an opportunity to check if I'm on the right track before applying them to fossil animals whose habits I cannot observe directly. You might be thinking, whoa, this seems like a lot of extra work to do for something that should be pretty obvious. If it had sharp teeth, it was a meat eater. If it had flat teeth, it was a plant eater. Identification done. Well, the trouble is, many ancient reptiles, like this beaked dinosaur, didn't have any teeth. So by looking for patterns across the entire body, rather than just the head, I hope to more accurately determine the diets of animals like these that have long been mysterious. This will allow me to reconstruct the appearance and the disappearance of plant-eating abilities in reptiles throughout time. With around 20% of reptile species today threatened with extinction, paleontology research like this has direct applications towards the future of conservation. The fossil record gives us deeper perspective to know how life responds to changes and challenges, including those related to diet and food availability. I look forward to sharing my results with scientists and the public as we seek to better understand the salad days of reptiles and how they might fare next. Thank you. I'm sure you can relate to these questions based on what you said just now. What is it about dinosaurs that fascinates kids? Do you have some insight? That's, that? a, that's the age old question. Yeah. But I think to me it's because they encapsulate something that requires imagination and something that's real. So if you look at the bones in a museum or you touch a specimen, you can tell that this animal was really around on Earth in the past. But then to imagine it in motion is always an act of creation because they're not going to move on their own. So that's why I think science media like movies, books, and shows really inspire a lot of people to be into science because it takes something that you can really see and touch that's present and then you can animate it. And I think that that's really neat and what captivates kids and why I was so baffled when Pokemon craze happened when I was in school mm -hmm. because I'm like, wait, that's cool, but like they weren't real. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, all my friends started playing Pokemon games and I was still doing dinosaur stuff, but <laughs> I'm still doing dinosaur stuff. So here I am. Yeah. Um, uh, I related to that question about kids' interest in dinosaurs, uh, you've shared that you love doing science outreach. Yeah. So have you been able to keep up with that? I know it's difficult with being a grad student, but... Yeah, I'm doing my best. I used to work in museums. And I love being able to talk to people every day about science, but then I wanted to do some of my own. So now that I'm in grad school, I have a podcast called Real Beasts, R-E-E-L, mm -hmm. Beasts, which is about prehistoric animals and how they appear in film. And we talk about the scientific questions that they bring up, but also just have fun chatting about the way media displays these amazing animals. And then there are also opportunities here at Davis. So there's like Biodiversity Museum Day that happened a couple weeks ago, showed a lot of specimens to families and everyone who wanted to come see that. There's picnic day. So I'm doing my best to find all those things, but the podcast on a week-to-week -week basis is what keeps me connected and sharing things with family 
and friends and maybe more than that someday. Oh, well, it's amazing. Do, do you, um, if you could travel back in time, <laughs> I'm guessing you're not gonna respond the 18th century, but <laughs> <laughs> let's call it what era. What era would you travel back to and why? Yeah, I've even thought about if I would, because part of the cool part about paleontology is that we can't know for sure. But if I could go back in time, it would be 75 million years ago, prime time, <laughs> because that's when there was this big inland sea going right through what is now North America. And so there was essentially tons of beachfront property covered in dinosaurs, just <laughs> about as good as it can get. And they were, they were really, really diverse at the time. And I would just love to see the way that they moved and try to solve some of these questions like, why do they have such weird crests on their mm -hmm. head? that have just been driving us wild for so many years. So it'd be nice if I had like, you know, a couple weeks there. <laughs> I'd come back and then my career would be set, definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.